71% of all the research and development that is done in the UK is done in the business arena. It's not done in higher education. 71%. People don't appreciate that. Hello there, I'm Sarah McCluskey and this is Research Adjacent. Each episode, I talk to amazing research adjacent professionals about what they do and why it makes a difference. Keep listening to find out why we think the research adjacent space is where the real magic happens. For this episode, my guest is John Elvin, Industry Programme Manager at the Royal Society. I actually recorded this interview a few months ago and I had forgotten just how much I laughed while recording it. I think you'll hear exactly why John describes himself as bouncy, to the extent that he had launched into his entire life story before I'd even hit record. But I think you'll also appreciate how his down-to-earth, people-centred approach helps him to thrive in a role which is all about connection and collaboration. Listen on to hear why he thinks all students should do a placement year, the importance of hiring people who are different to you, and why the contribution that industry makes to research and development is underrated. Welcome along to the podcast, John. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and have a chat. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. So I wonder if we could begin, as I do with all my guests, by inviting you to tell us what it is that you do. I work as an industry programme manager for the industry team in the Royal Society. And uh, the Royal Society is the independent uh, National Academy for Science uh, in the UK, and frequently, sometimes people, um, if I say I'm from the Royal Society, they say the Royal Society of what? So <laughs> sometimes I say the National Academy for Science, the Royal Society, that way around, because that helps uh, smooth the path so we don't get that question. So what do we do? Um, well, the Royal Society is is there to um, promote uh, science for the benefit of humanity. That's what it says in the mission statement. My part of it is to sort of bring back the Royal Society to its roots. Because if you think back to the very early 1660s, which is where the Royal Society started, you have a lot of applied science. You have a lot of science from industry. You have the steam engine. You have uh, papers on soaps and boilers. And more recently, you've had people like DeepMind and Demis and Sabis and and the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So you have applied science. So I think it is trying to regain the roots of the Royal Society back into appreciation of uh, science, the impact of science through translation. And the Royal Society is a really big part of some of the really big stories back in the history of science, isn't it? Indeed it is. You've got a a lot of things like, you know, theory of evolution. You've got um, things like Davy's safety lamp. Yes, um, all all things traced back, though. I always hesitate to get too lost in in the uh, the oh, we're the old big one because I once turned up to St Andrews who I think was founded in fourteen hundred and something or other <laughs> and, and said you're a couple of hundred years too late so, <laughs> so um, don't want to make a big thing of it. Fair enough, fair enough. Oh well, thank you very much for uh, coming along. So you haven't always worked at the Royal Society, have you? So what's been your career journey that's brought you to this point now? No, so I'm a relative newbie. I only started the 1st of March uh, 2021. Um, my career has essentially started out pretty classically as a researcher in the life sciences, uh, doing an undergraduate degree, then a, a DPhil, um, all doing research science, uh, and then having a postdoc at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Again, pretty um, solid researcher. Uh, and then at that point, I really... And this sort of links to the first thing I said. I really discovered I liked applied science. And and someone said, well, why don't you go and have a look at at industry? And there was an advertisement for a small biotech. Uh, And I showed it to my my supervisor then uh, in the laboratory of molecular biology. And I said, do you think I've got a chance of getting this job? And characteristically, um, he said, not if there's someone better. (laughs) <laughs> so I, I took, I took of confidence that, there I, t- I took I took that as permission to apply uh, uh, and I applied to this tiny biotech uh, with 30 people in it called Cambridge Antibody Technology which was based in Cambridge and had a technology that made antibodies so really straightforward stuff I really enjoyed that and essentially that uh, that was my career turning. I, I moved from the the academic things into industry, and I spent you know from 1995 through uh, up to 
2021 in a variety of different aspects of the same company because what was bizarre this is the life cycle of, of, of a of a biotech is that it has technology it grows it then gets purchased by a large company uh, and then it grows and then the, the technology moves on and, and that's effectively what happened and all the time I was sort of in various different roles initially in science mm-hmm. and then uh, and then moving out towards um, more outreach and and business development type activities so um, the great thing about uh, having a larger company is there are more roles in it and you can go and do things and it, I basically left the laboratory in 2010 mm-hmm. and and then moved into outreach uh, communications looking more at skills and started working with a, a number of different what we would describe as research adjacent I think on is, is on Things like skills, PhD studentships, um, looking at um, how industry interacts interacts with collaborations in academia. Having having sort of been in both, you can sort of relate to uh, how you should be doing collaborations. Doing a little bit of teaching as well, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, telling people about my uh, our our technology and things, and then working for the business development people, whereas um, mostly uh, like hosting tours of laboratories for mm. uh, overseas visitors, uh, which was very interesting because you, you got uh, numerous delegations and there would always be a variation of on a theme, uh, whereas that they would come along, they'd be very nice, and then they try and encourage our company to invest in their region. <laughs> <laughs> And it, whether it was from China or Brazil or Russia or whatever, it didn't make any difference. That was always the theme. Uh, but it was very interesting yeah. um, to, 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 to see that side of things. Um, so that, that's sort, sort of, there we go. That's the sort of potted history we have. Uh, being a, a research scientist, uh, being an industry scientist, moving into industry, more adjacent roles, especially outreach. And then um, I took redundancy from AstraZeneca in, in 2021 and um, saw the role in the Royal Society, which basically was all about promoting the values or interests of industry mm-hmm. uh, inside to the Royal Society, but also outside to the uh, the nation as well, which it sounded very attractive. Yeah. Oh, well, it sounds like uh, really interesting to hear the way that you could be with the same company essentially for such a long period of time, but do so many different roles. Is that quite common in industry? I I think it's unusual. I, I think it's, that may be a facet of the way that things did that. W- what there are are lots of different roles in larger companies. Mm-hmm. And uh, in smaller companies, you wear a number of different hats. And, sort of, and also sometimes in midsize, for example, um, Cambridge Antibody Technology was merged with a, another biotech called Medimmune. And then called many in UK, but it was still small enough so that you could wear a number of different hats. So I was had a big outreach hat, and I'll touch on that a, a bit later. But I had big outreach and into the community hat, a business development sort of hat, and also a sort of like site liaison sort of hat. And I got involved with things like the placement students and the PhD pr- programs, and got involved with liaison with the ABPI, the Association of uh, British Pharmaceuticals Industries uh, group. So that's the sort of the, again looking at the way that the the pharma industries um, are interested in things like collaborations, working with academics, and the skills agenda, which got me in again into the careers space. And these things build on each other because mm-hmm. once you sort of turn up to one of these types of meetings people notice that you've turned up and then you get invited to another one and i ended up um being invited to be a um co-opted member mm. of the cambridge university career syndicate so 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 you again you, you because you you do this sort of thing you get sort of noticed and people say oh that's interesting no we'd like to have someone come come along and, and give the industry viewpoint yeah which is um which is always interesting because that's sometimes something they lacked Yes, um, yeah. I think I think it is certainly in a lot of the situations that I've found myself in, both in the, yeah, I used to do a lot of work with schools and we try to collaborate with industry or also just being in universities as well, is that sometimes finding that person is a challenge. So yeah. I can see why when people found you, you they kind of latched on and said, come and do, come and do more stuff, do more of these things as well. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I really enjoyed it because I had this foot um, 
in the laboratory and I still knew all my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And when we were arranging outreach um, and going into schools and going into the science festivals and stuff, they knew me as a, as a scientist. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I had total credibility with them and I, I could work with them and, and still try to think about how am I going to make this particular activity interesting for, I don't know, seven to 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, a, a, believe me, that's a challenge. <laughs> oh, I love it. I used to do loads of that kind of stuff. But yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent. So so now you're in this role in the Royal Society, whereas if you said you're you're kind of promoting the interests of industry within the society. So is Indeed. that encouraging uh, the society to engage more with yeah, industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the idea is that... Um, there should be more awareness of how much research and development, even pure research and development, is done in the industrial sector. And there's one statistic that really is quite shocking. 71% of all the research and development that is done in the UK is done in the business arena. It's not done in higher education mm. or universities. 71%. And that's official. That's huge. ONS. People don't appreciate that. There yeah. is a lot of... R&D going on in businesses, small businesses, medium-sized, international, global businesses. The trouble is you can't recognize what you don't see. <laughs> and quite a lot of that R&D, although it's, it's spending a lot of money and it's generating a lot of knowledge, doesn't necessarily turn up in the publication record because sometimes they just won't. Yeah. Sometimes they will, but they'll make sure they have covered their patent position first yeah. so there's a bit of a delay and um but which is fine you you eventually get these these papers going out into into the journals but it, it's always a little bit delayed but uh, there's there was a study done by a good friend of mine called malcolm skingle at the gsk uh looking at the uh relative um, citation index mm -hmm. uh for uh academic only groups academics who collaborated with ac other academics mm -hmm or academics who collaborated with industry. Mm -hmm. And the impact factor from the industry academic collaborations was far higher. For some reason, that association with the industry, whatever reason, this is mostly in life sciences, so I can't speak for other sectors, was, was giving them the edge in terms of what people would, would go and read and go and look at. Yeah. So yeah. very interesting. Again, um, different ways of looking at things. And we can talk about collaborations between industry and academia because that's been quite a feature of my uh, research adjacent, as it were, uh, activities. Oh, well, well, go on. Do do tell us uh, about maybe some examples. Oh, or... yeah. yeah. Oh, I, OK. So the first thing to realise is that there's the difference between fee for service, which is basically you have some knowledge. I have some money. I will give you money for your knowledge no further interactions entered into very transactional mm -hmm. that's not collaboration no collaboration is when you share a mutual aim for what you want to do you both put it both intellectual and material some uh, sort of effort into it um it usually more industry money but there's mm -hmm. both inputs from both sides and you both want to use the outputs yeah and that's true collaboration. Mm -hmm. And once you have alignment of interests and alignment of goals, you will get the very best sort of collaborations. When one party can be industry, can be academic, is is only there for not those reasons, you won't get a proper collaboration. And it takes a while to work this one out. <laughs> and and successful, successful collaborations are always ones which are aligned. So and that, so that's... have have you been involved a lot in in making those collaborations happen then creating it, yes. the right environment and creating the right environment finding the right people making sure that we're doing the right thing making sure that our values are right and mm -hmm. uh, that the right people are being talked to the right thing and the agreements go well and sometimes they go well sometimes they don't go well so <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's it's always intellectual property that get people get stuck on and uh, and yeah. various different uh, various different research offices have different views, including international ones as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you know, I, I remember um, some some I'm not I won't name the universities, but extremely influential universities in mm -hmm. the US have very inflexible <laughs> attitudes to collaboration. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and and so beyond beyond having kind of shared 
or not necessarily shared goals, but a situation where both parties are clear about what they want to get out yeah. of it yeah. and getting the paperwork in yeah, order. Right. Yeah. Are there any other things that you've seen which are really key to a successful collaboration? I think be straight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be straight. Don't have alternative uh, agendas. Say what you want, want what you, and want what you say. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that that sort of uh, and that's more unusual than you might think. I mean, I mean <laughs> sometimes people don't understand that when you forward email chains, the whole of the email chain ah. it takes with it. And yeah. uh, there was one particular again, I won't name the companies, but this was a, a company company collaboration, and um, they were being all terribly nice and, and collaborative at the top of the email, but they covered in the whole chain which went back and back and back. And suddenly the language got very aggressive and oh, how yeah. they were going to hold our feet to the fire to make us do what they want. And they'd forward the whole email chain and he suddenly read the whole guy and said, hmm, <laughs> that's okay. So it's a lot of top show. Yes, yeah. On oh, the top dear. There. Oh, so, dear. But then we've all, we, I think yeah. we can all look back and find a time we've done something not dissimilar. That's right, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Um, well, I wonder if uh, thinking then about the journey that you've had, you could tell us about a couple of things that you've worked on that you've been really proud of. Um, I think probably what I'm most proud of is some of the outreach work that we um, did when um, I was in Medimmune and, and AstraZeneca, when uh, we devised a a challenge called the Energy Challenge. Mm-hmm. And this was all about... Uh, the energy that's stored in different foods. Hmm. And I went, I was working with a lot of schools at the time. And I said, um, I went to a primary school teacher and I said, what if a large pharmaceutical company could give you something that would be useful to teach science that you could, you could have, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And the answer came back, a mechanical balance. And I said, Mm -hmm. what really? Yes. Why mechanical? because it doesn't need batteries <laughs> and you can see how it works just yeah. by looking at it. So I thought, okay, that's really interesting. So I took that on board mm-hmm. and then we were sort of, div- and I, I came up with this proposal with some colleagues some brilliant colleagues, colleagues of mine saying, okay, so can we devise a challenge where we will use a mechanical balance that obviously they can keep because we'll give them the balance to do the experiment Mm -hmm. and then they can keep it afterwards and we came up with this idea of different foods have different calorific values Mm -hmm. um but you could say say you wanted to show i don't know 200 kilojoules of of peanut butter versus 200 kilojoules of kale yeah uh okay you 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 get different quantities um and then you can say well okay okay i've got 200 grams of butter and 200 grams of peanuts or 200 grams of lettuce. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that look like in terms of calories? So mm-hmm. we, we, we devised the situation where they would use their mechanical balance to weigh equal quantities or equal weights of, of different foods, then use a table to convert those weights into a calorie value and then show graphically show graphically that uh, the, uh, this amount of a tiny amount of peanut butter was worth you know sort of a field of lettuce <laughs> so, so so the idea would be that, that then they have this balance and the mm-hmm. balance can be used for all sorts of things so so we got approval from mm-hmm. our, our governance to do this and uh, we went out to uh, i think it's 53 primary schools over oh, 3000 wow. Five, uh, 700 pupils mm-hmm. uh, we used 76 volunteers from AstraZeneca estimated 540 or so different hours gone out there we went all the sort of schools in 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 sort of the catchment area in Cambridgeshire as far as we were prepared to to go for that uh we had this regional competition so we go to all the schools we clump them together in fives or sixes um this was aimed at year five year six Mm -hmm. and um and they make their posters and we get some people to come in and judge the posters. And then the winners of the regional competitions would all be invited to um, AstraZeneca Medimmune headquarters, um, which were then in Cambridge. Uh, it, was, it was then AstraZeneca then. And then the finals. And they'd all they'd all win something for being a finalist. But the grand finalists, we've got a special. I think they yeah. even got a grant of a few bits of money. And I asked, I asked again, what? 
what would make a good prize yeah. for 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 winning the regional final? And the primary school teacher said, things to measure things with, like <laughs> tubes, like uh, cylinders, For like the theme here. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, thing, things to like buckets, test tubes, yeah. things like. So we had a word with our suppliers who gave us all this laboratory equipment. So can you, you know, have you got some stuff? And we got all this plasticware in and tubes, and 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 that's what they won. That was their. Yeah. But being a finalist, they got test tubes, they got cylinders, things that they could measure, and of course, being plastic, really. Let's be clear about this reusable plastic. Yes. <laughs> um, they would last for a long time and yeah. they would be I hope they're still being used now. Oh, fantastic. Uh, that is quite yeah. an undertaking, having it done was, similar yes. sorts of things myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um and uh, we were actually recognized by the Script Awards and we won the best outreach at the Script Awards then. And um I had the, the great privilege of being shaken by the hand by Fiona Bruce. So there you go. A, a bit of style. Worth it just for that. <laughs> <laughs> to sprinkle on. The, but it, it was very nice. And I, I think that's very, why am I proud of that? Because there was so much work, so much coordination and so much um, good done to promote yeah. science and particularly industry science, if you like. You know, mm. I mean, there's always a, a, a thing there saying that, that, you know, we're interested in supporting the primary school children to learn about STEM subjects and to learn about science. And um, plus, you've got a really natty balance. It was, yeah, we actually nice. we went to Milton Keynes. It's Milton Keynes we went to to, to right. collect the balances, oh. and, and we got them from from the the, the producers, and uh, they they made them in China, but they were sort of selling them around Milton Keynes, and so uh, that was that was fun as well. So it was almost almost local. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, that sounds uh, amazing. So uh, uh, you know, actually, and I think I'm I'm also. Um, uh, proud that we uh, we put together you know some fairly nice uh, bids for doing um, the doctoral training program PhD mm -hmm. students. Um, AstraZeneca does take a lot of PhD students and quite a lot of uh, great you know it's great opportunities uh, to go and work in industrial laboratories as collaborative PhD students and uh, later we will talk about you know my my magic wish and I'll, and I'll I'll come on to the magic wish uh, when you ask me but it will be around uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh well, we can go for it now if you like. Oh, if you, you like. Okay. So, yeah. What would you use your yeah. research adjacent magic wand for? Okay. So I have an unlimited budget. And you do. Yeah. I can do whatever I like. Yeah. I would arrange that every single undergraduate doing a STEM science subject would have a placement in industry for a year and the reason i would do that is because i think that gives you a massive opportunity to find out that all can be otherwise as, as wittgenstein said um, all could be otherwise in a completely different immersive environment you find out about the the different things that are important to it, industrial or business and community you find there's different ways of doing things it's not just the, the things that have been shown in your university so my magic wand would be a, a placement for everyone excellent i think there's probably a lot of university people would be very glad about that as well because i know sometimes <laughs> finding those placements can be a bit a bit of well, a challenge yeah, that's, that's, why, that's why you need the money <laughs> that's why we need the magic <laughs> wand and the money and everything like that yeah and i'm a great believer as well in in that experiential learning and even if people do it and find out that they don't like it at least they're coming from a position yep. of knowledge that's a win. I mean, I've got very personal. I've got I've got uh, a daughter who's just completed a placement in a small biotech uh, in Salisbury, and um, the the difference between talking to her as a, a sort of second year undergraduate and having done a year in industry is she now talks the language. Mm -hmm. She now talks the language of science. She it's it's like they've done this a massive accelerated learning uh, and appreciate the difference. And, you know, they, they, the biotech said, had they the money, they would have offered her a job. And I said, well, you've got to complete your degree first. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, no, so, so I've seen this firsthand as well as through a lot of the work I did with placement students. I used to go to various different universities and talk about what the placements were. We'd all placements from different departments in in Medimmune. It was mostly Medimmune at that time, but AstraZeneca was doing a separate scheme. And um, and then we'd just go and, and talk to them and say, these are the schemes, these are the things you can do, these are the kind of projects, and you know, please apply through the website here. And uh, I've seen the impact that placement mm. students have had on a company at first hand, first hand. So uh, you you get them in and you know from from the, the beginning, they, they they struggle to know where the pointy end is yeah. uh, on the prepared. Uh, about halfway through, they flip and they start mm -hmm. changing the processes 
in the company for the better. Mm -hmm. So like a six months you're teaching and then six months you're gaining. Yeah. Uh, and they, they do brilliant work. And I've seen, you know, graduate level, uh, postgraduate level talks at the end of the year. Some of my most, you know, heartwarming, heartwarming events is when I've seen these grads, these undergraduates, the undergraduates give graduate level talks yeah. at the end of the year. So that's, uh, yeah. I, mean, I know that they're going to go on and do great things in science. No, I used to teach in a college and I used to teach um, people who were coming on day release from companies to do their degree. So they'd kind of done it the other way around. They went into the companies first and they were my favourite students by miles mm -hmm. for the same reason, because they just were functioning on a completely different level. You know, they just understood the importance of the it, it wasn't just theoretical you know they understood yeah. why they needed to learn about this stuff and why it was going to be important to them. absolutely very strong parallels to the apprenticeship programs the degree mm -hmm. apprenticeships when they're, they're coming in they come in and they're, they're on they're on a particular it's quite narrow apprenticeships but then they go and do their uh their, their, their degree on wednesdays usually <laughs> and um I'm sure and... it was wednesdays for us as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> for, some, for some reason wednesdays are, are it uh, and then and, and they they were these are very practical people they, mm -hmm. they were practical focused people and yeah. they wanted they wanted to know why it was and then then it made the theory make sense yeah because they, they knew why they were using it so yeah yeah, so that I would say, yeah, in terms of, of being proud, I think some of the things that we, we've done for outreach and some of the things we've done for PhD students and placement students, definitely excellent. Brilliant. Oh, well, that sounds like a very excellent use of the research adjacent <laughs> magic wand, granted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hurrah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, not to not to kind of bring the tone down uh, too much, but I'm sure there must have been some hurdles along the way on your journey. Any particular challenges that you found? I I think, um, and and you can see this. I'm quite an extroverted character. Mm. I'm quite a bouncy person. I've been given nicknames of like Tigger and uh, bouncy Labrador and like that. And I think one of my biggest challenges is to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> that's one of the, uh, certainly that is one of the biggest challenges I've, I've learned. Um, I even went as far as to put, today I are an introvert uh, on my desk. And I just like had to try and realize that not everyone works the same way. Mm -hmm. If you do this Myers-Briggs personality type test, um, most of my colleagues in research were these um, all clustered around ISTJs, which mm -hmm. are in the sort of top left hand corner, all kind of very kind of introverted, uh, looking at detail and, and planning. Uh, and I was a big fat E down the, the other end of the corner with everything else hovering around the middle, which mm -hmm. uh, meant, you know, basically the only thing you could say that I was extroverted. And I've come to conclusion that the strongest teams have a mixture of introverts and extroverts so now when i'm recruiting i actively seek out people who are not like me because that will make the stronger team yeah. uh, i remember very very uh, early on we were recruiting for um, a position in the laboratory that I was building uh, it was a hybridoma uh, laboratory which is an older technology but it was had a new twist but I was I was interviewing this person who was oh we were getting on like house on fire she was great oh we had you laughing all my jokes which is always a bad sign um, <laughs> and um, and then there was this other person I was luckily I was with another more experienced interviewer and and he said afterwards I said yeah I know you liked the first one I know you did because I could see but don't you think the team would be better balanced if you if you had the second one. Mm. and I took that to heart and I, I really took that to heart and uh, so a challenge is, is myself sometimes the challenge is me and the other challenges are all to do with people mm. there are there are people who do things that are difficult <laughs> to put it um to put it clearly so if if you find people who make unsubstantiated claims mm -hmm. Uh, they assert something and it's not true. Difficult to deal with. Mm. I've met people whose response to it's not working is do it more. Okay. <laughs> Definition of insanity, isn't it? Yeah. Something like Einstein. Something like that. Do yeah. it more. So the reason it's not working is I'm not doing enough of it. No, it's yeah, not it's, working because yeah. there's something it's fundamentally the wrong. I've met people who um, that must be wrong because I don't want that result. 
I've met people like that. So um, I've met people who look down on technical help or technical technical Mm. people, which is mad because they do these technical jobs in and out every week. They are the experts. You may have a bigger degree than they have, but they are the experts. You listen to them, people. Um, I've got people who are fear fear of failure. Mm. Um, If I fail... I will be forever tainted with that failure. Mm. Not true. No. <laughs> it depends how you deal with that failure. Yeah. What is failure? And sometimes people say failure is when you learn. Learn, and if, yeah. And, and if you succeed, well, what have you learned? Apart from mm-hmm. that it's quite nice to succeed, but yeah. that's not anything new. And I think the worst one is people who um, have a fear of challenge. Um it's something that we need to embrace Mm -hmm. and it should be done in the right way but um some people all they can see is the is the the conflict they can't they can't see the contribution and that that comes back to the difference between collaboration and competition Mm -hmm. uh some people say oh you'll only get the best from people if you set them up in competition and you, mm-hmm. and you know the sorts of people have two groups working on the same project and then the winners you know get the spoils some people say oh you'll only get the best thing if you do collaboration so we must be terribly co- collaborative and and then the unfortunate truth is actually you need a mixture yeah. you need a little bit of mixture of competition competition and collaboration both are useful but the nuanced uh, <laughs> the nuanced view is always the least popular because it's it's much harder to put across. So yeah. biggest challenges uh, one myself to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Uh, but yet here we are getting on in a world of people and with things that we can't control so uh, yes yeah oh well thank you for your honesty on that though (laughs) I think honesty and uh self uh self-knowledge I think these are these are things that I've learned come yeah as you get older the experience you start to realize as you say everything's not black and white I've often said that all I see is gray um, yeah yeah it, it is it is shades of gray and um, most people don't wake up and think I want to do a bad job no um, absolutely and, I mean there there, there's a, there, <laughs> there is an example of, of of me having more more, more sense than my supervisor because my supervisor got got a poor review for one of his papers and mm-hmm. he was convinced he knew who'd done it he Ooh. didn't it was anonymous yeah and he and he was gonna he was gonna fax a v sign <laughs> to oh, this dear. to this professor and and it was me the phd student <laughs> who had to talk him down <laughs> for not faxing the v sign so maybe that was an maybe that was an early sign that, yeah <laughs> that i was beginning to think oh maybe you shouldn't always be give in to your emotions no yeah oh uh, I, I i succeeded he didn't good good <laughs> excellent <laughs> phd just for that yeah <laughs> Uh, well, I, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, I'm sure we could keep going for hours, but we should probably think about wrapping the conversation up. So I wonder, um, whereabouts can people find you if they'd like to get in touch or know more about what you do? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm definitely on LinkedIn. I, I occasionally post things on the Royal Society, but you'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the best way. I'm, I'm... Yep. Definitely. Um, it's, it's the tool I use the most in terms of, uh, of trying to promote um, what we do and uh, try to. I also use LinkedIn as a sort of way of getting knowledge about what everyone else is doing as well. It's a, it's it's, a, it's quite it's actually one of the most benign social medias. It's, I think that's true. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Well, I'll get a link to your profile and put that on the show notes. Uh, but it just remains to say thank you so much for taking the time to come and have a chat today. I've enjoyed myself immensely, Sarah. Thanks for listening to Research Adjacent. If you're listening in a podcast app, please check you're subscribed and then use the links under the episode to find full show notes and to follow the podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter or Instagram. Also, make sure that you're subscribed to the Research Adjacent Roundup newsletter. You can also find all the links and other episodes at www.researchadjacent.com. 
Research Adjacent is presented and produced by Sarah McCluskey and you, yes you, get a big gold star for listening right to the end. See you next time.